Well, good morning, everyone. Would you, as you're making your way, finishing in, would you stand with us? And I want to do something this morning with you before we get into our first song. So uh, as you take a look around, one of the cool parts about coming to worship together is that it's not just an individual thing. Yes, our praise is, is directed towards the Lord, but it's something we get to do and participate in together. And one of the joys of worship is being able to look around and watch and see, oh, there's like 200 other people doing the same thing that I'm doing right now. Take a moment, if you would, before we start. Turn to someone next to or around you and say, thanks for coming this morning. I'm excited to sing with you. (laughs) All right, let's sing together.
as we hear a little bit of what's happening in our church together. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dick Alberg. It's great to be able to greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Whether you're here worshiping with us or whether you're watching online, we welcome you and extend to you God's grace this morning, of which we are all recipients. So thank you for coming. I believe that God has something special for each of us when we gather together. There are a few ways that we want to connect together. One of those is called the Connect Card. You've probably heard that referred to before. There's one in the seat in front of you. If you have something to give us information about, please do that if you're new with us. It's a good way to connect. But what we're really excited about is that we're launching a new website. It's our website relaunch. And the photo on the left shows that very often our glasses that we look through get kind of hazy and cracked, and that's what our old website was. So we're excited that, in a sense, we have gotten a new front door to our church. It's a way that you can connect with us. It's a way that especially newcomers are able to connect. If you click on to the Free Church or the Malacca Free Church's website, you'll see probably something like this. And just a reminder on navigation of it. If you don't see up on the top exactly what you want, if you scroll down to the bottom, Always remember on our website, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find a full menu where you can cl click on to any one of those options. If you would click on to something like uh, uh, our team, that's what talks about our staff and people who work here at the church. If you scroll down to the very bottom of that, this menu will come up again. So it's just a good reminder for you. Uh, we're kind of excited about it. Uh, there's a lot of new graphics and everything on that. It's a great way for you to connect. You will still receive in, the, in your email every week what's called the loop, which is looks something like this. And it has on it all of the announcements that pertain to you, all of the information you need, the Sunday morning service, how to connect live as well. So... Um, there are many opportunities for you to be able to connect well with us and us to be able to connect well with you. One of those things, and only one I'm going to highlight this morning, is that we have a new members class coming up on October 9th. A number of you have asked about that, and our board and uh, staff has put together a membership class. We'll be hosting it on October 9th right after the morning service at 11.30. That'll go on for about 45 minutes. So if you're interested, you can put it on the Connect card, you can talk to someone in the office, or you can go to the link that's on that loop, and it gives you a place to sign up for that. So I hope that uh, if uh, you're considering membership, you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Again, we welcome you with God's grace um, let's stand together, and now you can tell people, you know, it was great to sing with you. I heard you singing, and you did awesome. Thank you for your warmth. It's great to be able to greet each other as we continue now in our time of worship. You can go ahead and be seated. And uh, our ushers are going to be coming forward at this time to receive the tithes and offerings that you have 
uh, prepared to bring today. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you that you supply for every one of our needs. First and foremost, you supplied for our um, condition that we were born with of sin and that you provided hope and salvation and warmth and grace through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So thank you for this spiritual provision. But thank you for how you provide for us as individuals as well. And as a church body, we thank you that you provide through the faithfulness of your saints. So Father, we pray that you would take this offering and use it as we continue to seek to spread the gospel to this community and around the world. We thank you now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we want to sing together now about two different things. Um, the first is the character and the, and the nature of Christ as our cornerstone, that he is the, the solidness, the rock that we can depend on. And then in response to that, to sing about the trust that we have and the dependence that we have on him. So you can just remain seated where you're at um, as they're passing the plate and finishing. And we're going to sing together uh, as we... Uh, speak of Christ as our cornerstone. shall come with trumpet 
with sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, trust in His righteousness alone. Fall the stand before the throne. Would you guys stand with us for our next song of worship? Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Lord Jesus, there are many times in life when we feel inadequate and inefficient and insufficient to do the things that you have called us to do, whether they are new things, whether they are old things. Um, Lord, we call on your name to give us that sufficiency that we need. It says in scripture that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, you can have a seat. If you are a kid who fits the description for Kids Zone, we have a number of adults ready in the back for you. So at this time, you can go ahead and head back there, if that applies to you. And uh, we're going to hear together from Patrick. So Patrick, would you come and uh, share what the Lord's prepared? Good. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, worship team. I'm Patrick Drury. I live in Becker. I've pastored in the Evangelical Free Church in a couple of different states over the course of about 22 years, and I've uh, been asked to come and open the word with you today, and I am honored to do so. Uh, I, I'm no longer pastoring currently. I'm currently a Christian conciliator and help uh, marriages, families, and churches work through conflict and work on things that can help them grow as leaders. And so I've been here before. Do you remember? Two or three, you do, good. <laughs> that, well, maybe that's good, maybe it's not. Uh, it's been two or two and a half years or something like that, and uh, I was here after having the privilege of working with some in this church to see God do some miraculous things as people were open to listening and learning and growing together with one another and uh, have continued on and off working with uh, the elders of this church. And I just wanna tell you, one of my criteria for effective elders as I was a pastor is I wanted, I always wanted my elders to be fat. Only wanted fat elders. Faithful, available, and teachable. It's kind of a core requirement for anybody in leadership. Um, I can't really judge availability because I'm not here in this church with you, but I can tell you that the, the leaders of this church have shown themselves to be faithful and they've shown themselves to be teachable. And that is a tremendous gift. And it's one that I'm thankful for and uh, I count as a, a, a wonderful privilege for you. So I, as I've been thinking about this, I also wanted to congratulate you on getting the pizza paddle on Friday night. Um, it's good, good things are happening in Malacca. Well, I wanna to talk to you this morning on the topic of prayer. And I've titled this sermon, An Essential Prayer. It's not titled The Essential Prayer because the essential prayer would be the Lord's Prayer. Jesus himself gave us a model prayer that we should use and we should use on a regular basis. Uh, but this is an essential one. It's a really, really important prayer that I have found so valuable to me and so valuable in helping uh, believers grow up in Christ together. And I'm excited and pleased to be able to share it with you this morning. So as we begin to think about prayer this morning, uh, that is, as it says on the screen, Ephesians chapter three, if you wanna turn there. As we begin to think about prayer, I just wanna get the wheels turning for you and ask a couple of questions. The first of all, first question is, what is it that prompts you to pray? When you find yourself praying, what prompted you to pray? It's kind of a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer out loud. But sometimes there's uh, maybe a situation has come up in life, a need that comes up, and that prompts us to pray. Sometimes something, we, we receive news uh, of a, a tragedy, and that might prompt us to pray. Some prayers are prompted by healthy routines, like when we sit down to eat. That's a routine for most of us, most believers, to say, hey, let's pray and give thanks for this food. Uh, that's a great one. Worship services prompt us to pray. What is it that prompts you to pray? I know people that every time they see an ambulance go by, they'll stop and they'll pray. Uh, there's different things. But secondly then, when you pray, what do you pray about? 
What is the content of your prayer? Do you pray about your life? Do you pray about God and what he's doing? Do you pray about uh, good things or pray through struggles and hard things? What do you pray about? This morning I want us to take a look at Ephesians chapter 3. You know, one of the things that I have learned over the years is prayer doesn't need to be a big mystery to us. How do we pray? What do we pray about? But in fact, the Word of God is filled with prayers that we can pray. It, there's a lot of teaching about prayer, but just as good, there are a lot of prayers we can actually pray. The book of Psalms can be prayed. You just pick a psalm and just read it and read it as if you're just saying it back to the Lord. It's awesome. There are prayers in the Old Testament and prayers in the New Testament. One rich area of prayer in the Bible is the writings of the Apostle Paul. As he wrote to churches and believers, he would often say, hey, by the way, here's what I'm praying for you, and he writes out the prayer. And so we can see that, and we can use those prayers. Say this, when I pray these prayers, this is a biblical way to pray for people. And so that's what this one is. This Ephesians 3 prayer is an effective prayer for you to use, and that I'll apply it that way at the end. Use this prayer. Pray it for other people. And you can pretty much pray it as is, and you will find that God will use that prayer in people's lives and use it in yours as well, as he has used it in mine. So I want to begin this morning by reading this prayer out loud. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Father, as we take a look at this prayer this morning, thank you. It is beautiful and rich for us. It is a ready-made prayer for us, and we have so much we can learn from it. Lord, thank you for providing it. I pray this morning that you would open it and shine your light upon it and help us to understand the wonderful things contained in this prayer. Lord, we just ask that you would speak powerfully to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever faced a situation in your life where you just felt powerless? There's nothing you can do. We face these situations from time to time. A friend of mine was just the other day, earlier in the week, telling me about his dad who was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's. There's nothing he can do. Can't change the situation. He's praying about it, but he feels powerless. I know in my family, we just married off my second son. I have four sons. Uh, one of them is here today. We just got our second one married off. That whole stage of parenting is done. We can't do it anymore. We can't go back. We can't teach things we wish we would have taught. Uh, he's on his own, and, and in a way, we can't, 
We just have to accept that reality. There are a lot of things in life that leave us feeling powerless or small or weak. And yet when we pray, we pray to the, our almighty Father. We pray to a God who is omnipotent. He has all power. And so when we pray to him, we can pray to the one who does have the ability to bring change. We can pray to God who has all power in all situations. And in this prayer, Paul is saying, he is praying for power. He comes back to it several times. He's praying for the power of God to reveal itself in a few specific areas. And so this morning as we, as we look at these areas, just, we, we just are admit right up front, these are things we need God to do to help us understand, to help us learn and grow. The first area Paul prays for power is for the power for Christ to dwell in us. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He's praying for power power so that you can experience Christ dwelling or living in your heart through faith. The first house that Kimberly and I bought, it was a fixer-upper, if you know what I mean. Because I was right out of seminary and had no money at all. For some unknown reason, Wells Fargo Bank decided to loan us enough money to buy a house and we bought a house that was a fixer-upper. It was a mess. Uh, it, we, we, in fact, the first time we walked through it, Kimberly's like, nope. I said, well, let's take another, <laughs> let, let's go take another look. And, uh, and we looked again, and I said, well, it has good bones. You know what that means? I'm not actually sure what that means. What it meant to me was, I'm not going to move any walls, I don't have that skill, but I can paint and we can tear out all the surfaces and redo those. And so we did. This house, this house though, had been lived in by an elderly woman whose husband had passed years before. She did, hadn't done anything in decades. Uh, the, the carpet was thick 70s shag, bright red, bright green, bright blue. You know, each room had its own theme. Um, it was old and nasty. The bathroom was carpeted. <laughs> yeah, and it had a deep, deep, deep odor of years and years of urine soaked into the car. I mean, it was gross. It was awful. And so we moved into this house, and we get in there, and it's like, I remember standing in the kitchen right after we signed papers at the bank, signed our lives away, and I felt absolutely sick. What have we done? But this was our home in which we had come to dwell. So we got to work. And we started changing things. Uh, we changed everything that we could change over the years. In fact, um, the bathroom, we had to get all the way down to the through the, we removed all the floor down into those studs that you can see in the basement and rebuilt it from the bottom up. But over time, our house became a home, and it became a home in which we were pleased to dwell. Paul is telling us that, Christ, that he's, he's praying that we would have the power so that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. When we accept Christ into our hearts, he is not coming into a finished product. He's moving into a fixer-upper. And when Christ came to dwell within your heart, he said, well, he, he's got good bones. She's got good bones. 
<laughs> Meaning, the image of God is in you, but everything else is kind of a mess. And Jesus gets to work bringing change within us so that we would become a place in which he would be pleased to dwell. The, the act of, of being a Christian, having Christ dwelling in our heart, means there's this constant addressing of sin, of pride, of anger, of weakness, of failure, of all the junk that has accumulated in our hearts as sinful people, and Jesus is changing us over time, and we work with him for that to happen. One of the things that you may uh, be aware of in a, in a home remodeling project, there's something called a, a, um, a demolition phase. If you're going to change out the kitchen and put in new cabinets, you have to first go tear out the old ones. And as I think about Christ dwelling in our hearts, doing his home improvement projects on us, how many of you have ever been through a spiritual demolition phase at the hand of God? We all have. If, if Christ dwells in you, he dwells in you to demolish all that is not him. It's called the mortification of the flesh. There's a lot of terms for it in the Bible. And as we experience those things, those are painful. As we go through the refiner's fire, to remove the things within us that shouldn't be there, it's painful. And I, I mention this because as, as we think about as we think about prayer, Paul is praying that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. By necessity, that means that there's demolition phase, there's the pain of change, and yet as I think about that first question we started with, what prompts you to pray, what do we pray about? Have you found yourself prompted to pray because something in your life is in pain? I sure have. There's something happening I don't like. Physical diagnosis, broken relationship, loss of a job, uh, some, some awful thing. I don't like it. I don't want it. I'm praying for God to stop. I think what we do, and I'm saying it because I realized I used to do this, is I would be praying for God to stop the thing in my life that God is actually doing in my life to make me more like Christ. When we pray shallow prayers or prayers based on our circumstances, we're actually praying for God to stop changing us to become like Jesus. When we pray biblical prayers, we push through that and realize there's a greater work going on in my heart right now. And I want to pray that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith and all that that entails. And we need power. We need the power of God to see through our own struggles, our own discomforts, and our own hurts to see God is at work. And I want to cooperate with him so that I can become more like Jesus. It's not our natural place that we land but God can give us the power to pray and grow that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. The second thing, and, and this is critical that it's linked, the second power he gives us is the power to grasp the love of God. That's really cool. You know, there's two kinds of demolition that can happen in a home. One is, I hate this house and I want to destroy it. We're going to demolish it. The other is, I love this house and we're going to improve it. Both have demolition involved, but one is for the good and for the improvement. As we go through difficulties in our own life, as Christ dwells within us, Paul is going to remind us that by the power of God, we can experience the, his love. The difficulties, the improvements, the projects that God is doing in you is because of his incredibly deep love for you. 
more than you know. How much does God love you? How much does God love you? God's love for you is more sincere and passionate than you think. God's love for you is more consistent and steady than we think. I often think God loves like me, like I do, which can be kind of finicky and changing from day to day. God's love is faithful. It's constant. God's love is more robust for you than you have yet realized. That's good news. I think we literally need the supernatural power of God to understand the depth of his love for us. Listen to Paul's words. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, that's a reality whether you know it or not. So I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How much does God love you? God is literally asking, or Paul is, he's praying that you would understand something that goes beyond understanding. That we would comprehend something that we can't comprehend, which is why we need the power of God. How much water flows over Niagara Falls? Have you ever been there? Some of you have been there, so you know. I have no idea how much water flows over Niagara Falls, but I've stood there and felt the earth constantly shaking from its power and heard the constant roar. And in that way, I don't know the fact of how much water flows over, but I get to feel it. How big is the earth? I don't know, but I did get to fly to China a couple years ago. I know how long it takes to get halfway around it. (laughs) It's pretty big. How does God form babies in mother's wombs? I don't know. I got to walk through four of our children being developed and see them being born. It's a pretty awesome experience. How much does God love you? It's probably a difficult thing to answer on paper, but you can experience it with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because it's real. Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever sensed God's delight in you? Have you ever seemed to be aware that he's singing over you? And I'm asking that knowing for many of you, the answer would probably be no. I've never felt that the way I would like to feel it. That gets shrouded from us by our own sense of guilt, our own sense of shame, how we experience love from our parents. All that stuff can cloud us and mess us up and make it hard to experience the love of God. And Paul is praying for the power to know God's love for you. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him 
would not perish but have eternal life. We may never fully understand how powerful God's love for us is, but God wants you to know it. God desires for you to experience it. And this requires the power of God. We are saved, we are rooted and established in love, but it doesn't mean we automatically get it. He's praying that we'd have power to get it. Uh, Just a chapter earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul had said, because of his great love for us, because of God's great love for us, God who's rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace that you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and describes uh, early in the book of Ephesians all these things God has done for you, bringing salvation and life to you because of his love for you. To keep learning who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, and you'll keep piecing together the depth of the love of God for you. God loves you just as you are, but he doesn't want you to stay just as you are. He also has a loving work to improve you. I love to catch fish. Uh, We usually catch bass because that's easier to do. I'm terrible at catching walleye. When I, on the very rare occasion I do, I'm excited about that fish. Yes, a walleye, oh my gosh, how did that happen? I accidentally caught a walleye. And I'll pull it out and I like what I see, but I'm not content with what I have because that fish comes home with us. And he goes through a change at the end of my knife and he becomes a filet And I like that, too. And I think when God saves us, you know, he describes, we'll make you fishers of men. He fishes for us. He saves us. But then he fillets us. All that is flesh, all that is not of his spirit, all that junk is going to be cut away. And it's, it's, it's hard for us to imagine God's deep and abiding love for us in the way we were when he caught us and his deep and abiding love for us as he changes us into the image of Christ because our experience of that change is often experienced through pain, through cutting away of things that I love. Wait, you're cutting away that thing that's not of Christ, but I like it. And God changes us out of his deep and abiding love to make us more like Christ. And I think this is why Paul is saying this takes the power of God for us to experience that love. He says that we may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love. One, grasp it is an intellectual thing, so I can understand more and more, but then to know it is an experiential thing. I want to actually experience this love in my life so that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So how much does God love you? How could you measure God's love? Is God's love 10 feet? Is it 10 miles? Think of that children's book, I Love You to the Moon and Back. I remember in um, one of the Avengers movie, Tony Stark's daughter told him, I love you 3,000. It's like, whoa. I don't know what that means, but it sounds like a lot. 
How much does God love you? Sometimes it helps to flip the question, flip the coin to the other side, and ask, how much did Jesus suffer for you? How did Jesus measure the cross? He was a carpenter. He probably could have measured it accurately. Maybe it was six feet wide. I don't know how he measured the cross, but I do know that he stretched his arms out and fully experienced every bit of it so that he could take away all that kept us from fully experiencing the Father's love. Paul wants us to have the power for Christ to dwell in us, the power to really learn more and understand and experience the love of God. And when we put all of us together, then that power results in glory, the glory of God in the church. He finishes this prayer by saying, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It is possible for us to meet on Sunday morning without the power of God. We could launch our fall adult Bible studies and small groups and children's ministries without the power of God. Organizations do it all the time. But what would it look like to fully embrace the power of God? That Christ would dwell among us and we would function within his love. It's a difference God wants us to experience. He wants us to experience his power here amongst one another and as we live here in this community so that God would receive glory through his church. And this is a prayer for that. So as we, as we think about prayer and how we should pray, This is a call for us to pray deeply. Pray when those situations come up. Oh, I need to pray about that. Or someone says, hey, my daughter is going to be going through the taking her driver's exam on Tuesday. Pray about that. Or my my mother fell and broke her hip. Pray about that. But I want to encourage you to not just pray about that, but to pray for the power of God underneath that. Pray that that person would experience the indwelling Christ within them, that they would come to know and experience the tremendous love of God as they go through it. Pray that through all these circumstances, God would be glorified through his church. So here's your assignment that I have for you. I'm going to leave you with this assignment today. I want you to take the prayer. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Take that prayer, so make a note of that, or write it down on a card, or pull it up on your phone, whatever you need to do. And I want you to pray that prayer three times every day this week. Three times every day this week. Pray that prayer first for yourself. Would you do that? Pray that prayer for yourself. It's easy to modify it. You Essentially, like I said at the beginning, you can just read the prayer out loud back to God. Pray it for you. Secondly, pray this prayer for one person in your family. Maybe your husband and wife, or your wife or your, one of your kids. Pray it for one person in your family. Uh, I have prayed this prayer for my wife 
I don't know, a lot of times over the years. It's simple to do. You just pray something like this. I pray that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen Kimberly with power through your spirit in her inner being so that Christ may dwell in Kimberly's heart through faith. And I pray that Kimberly, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that Kimberly may be filled to the full measure of all the fullness of God. Tweak some of the words a little bit so that you can apply it. Pray it for yourself, pray it for someone in your family, and third, pray it for one other person. Ask God who that person is. Pray it for yourself, pray it for someone in your family, and say, Lord, now who should I pray this for? And I guarantee he will answer and he will put someone on your mind. And it might be someone you don't expect. It might be someone who, for whom it is hard for you to pray for, And you'll be praying that they would be filled with the presence of Christ and overwhelmed with the love of God. And that they would be part of God's glorious mission to bring glory to himself through his church. So would you do that for me? Would you give me a response? Would you commit to at least try not, we don't really do anything perfectly, but at least give a good attempt to pray it three times every day for yourself, for someone in your family, and for someone else who God shows you. Would you do that? All right, I wanna just encourage you with that. Um, When I have used this prayer in this way, I've seen tremendous change right here because God answers it in me and when I pray it for other people God uses it to help me see other people in a more God honoring and biblical way so do that you will you will enjoy it let me pray for you uh, this morning to close and then I want to repeat the final Phrase because it is functionally a doxology for us. Father, thank you so much for this prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. Thank you for giving us just dozens and dozens of prayers in the Bible that we can use. Lord, I do, uh, I do pray that you would help all of us, myself included, to apply this this week, to pray this prayer for ourselves and the people around us. And Lord, would you change us? Do way more than we can ask or even imagine. And we just pray that you would would give us the strength to do that well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, with that, would you stand with us um, and let's respond together and confess our dependency on the Lord. Thank you.
be true of us this week, that we would seek the Lord and depend on Him. Uh, Go in peace. You're dismissed.